Okay, uh, my name's Dominic Golding. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our, uh, the final presentations of the WPI uh, student projects that have been conducted on Nantucket at the Nantucket Project Center for the last uh, seven weeks. Uh, as many of you may know, we've been doing projects on islands since about 2008. So far, we've conducted uh, 74 projects, 261 students. Uh, we do a lot of projects with various departments in town government. Uh, we work with a number of other uh, NGOs, and we've done uh, a variety of projects with uh, some of the local museums also. Um, all of these projects, uh, all of the past projects, are the materials from them, the presentations, the reports, and so forth, are posted on the Nantucket Project Center website, uh, which is at uh, this URL. Uh, the projects that are going to be presented today, and we have six projects, six teams presented on six different topics, those also will be posted on the website uh, by the end of this week. And so if you want to look at the report or review the presentation and other materials that the students have put together, those should be available, uh, I hope, by, uh, by Friday. Uh, before we get going, uh, and I will introduce each of the teams in turn, uh, I would like to uh, thank a few people. Uh, who make all this possible. Uh, working in Nantucket is always an absolute pleasure. Uh, as I say, we've been doing projects here since 2008. We do projects all over the world, but the projects uh, on Nantucket, it, Nantucket is just such a wonderful community. It's always very welcoming. It's extraordinarily easy for us to do projects here, and we love doing projects here. Um, I would li first like to thank all our project sponsors. Um, the students will introduce uh, themselves and uh, the sponsors they've worked with shortly. Um, I'd like to call out a few other people who have uh, uh, supported us this term and in many previous terms also. Remain Nantucket has always been a, a staunch supporter of the Project Centre. Um, and this year, they, uh, they uh, as they have done in the past, supported the treasure hunt that the students participate in in their first uh, weekend on island as a way to get to know the... Uh, um, downtown in particular. So I'd like to thank Cecil, Baron Jensen, Rachel Hobart, Vina Gonzalez, and uh, Jen King uh, for, for putting that all together and also sponsoring the project this term. And I'd also like to thank Melanie Hajar for um, putting that treasure hunt together. Uh, Harvey Young, Ellen Young, Jasper Young, and Emma Young have, uh, uh, and all the staff at Young's Bicycle Shop. I'd like to thank them for uh, supporting us yet again. Uh, for the last uh, 13 years, Harvey and, and Young's Bicycles have uh, provided us with bikes every time that we're on island. And uh, it's the way that we get around. We don't allow students to uh, bring cars to the island, um, but they explore the island by bicycle, which is, uh, as Harvey would say, the best way to get around. I'd like to thank the Nantucket Yacht Club Peter McEachern um, and uh, Vin Ramo in particular, and also their staff for making our students welcome. It's where our students have stayed for the last several years. Uh, it's a great location, it's a great facility, uh, and we're really happy uh, that they uh, let us use it. I'd also, uh, as everyone knows, um, space is a premium on Nantucket. Um, and it's often difficult for us to find places for the students to work. So I'd like to thank uh, several people that have provided us with uh, places to work. The, uh, um, Brian Lenane at the uh, Nantucket Community School. Uh, we had the Remain team working there. Uh, Emily Molden at the Land Council uh, made an office on the top floor of their building available to another team. And the uh, uh, Nantucket Athenaeum also is always uh, been gracious in allowing us to use their facilities whilst the students are on island. Um, I'd like to thank the Nantucket Historical Association, um, Johanna Richard and her staff for making uh, the Whaling Museum open to our students whilst they were here. Uh, I hope that they all took uh, um, advantage of that very gracious offer. Uh, also, one of the things that we always have trouble with uh, when we go around the world is finding, believe it or not, a gym for our students. Um, like, even if they've got bicycles, they still need to seem to want to lift weights. And so we were very lucky that the high school, um, the uh, athletic directors there, um, Travis Lombardi and uh, Matt Hunt, uh, made arrangements for our students to get in there. So uh, certainly thank them for doing that again this year. 
And then uh, I would like to thank the uh, crew at uh, uh, Community TV. They are um, filming this today. It's going out live. It will be uh, recorded and available for later viewing also. A uh, couple of other people I'd like to thank. Uh, Fred Luft, who's here in the audience, and uh, is my uh, uh, co-advisor whilst I'm here. It's been a delight to uh, advise with Fred. Fred's been on the island several times before, um, uh, but this is the first time he and I have advised, I, uh, and it's been a, an absolute pleasure. Um, I'd like to thank all the students for all their hard work. I think Fred and I really appreciate all that they've done. Um, this is not an easy thing for students. They've never done projects like this uh, for this uh, sort of extended period. Um, um, so it is a lot of work. We hope it's also a lot of fun. And then lastly, I'd like to thank all the other members of the community that make our stay on the island so pleasant and so productive. Um, all of those folks who have answered uh, questionnaires, uh, been responsive to student uh, questions in interviews and so forth. Um, we really couldn't do it without you. And as I say, it is, is a, a real pleasure to come to Nantucket because the community always makes us so welcome. So just in terms of the, the mechanics for today, um, we will have about 15-minute uh, presentations from each of the teams in turn, uh, separated by about five minutes for questions and answers. We have some people in the audience here live. Uh, I would ask that whoever wants to ask a question in the audience come up to this microphone um, to pose their question, mostly because if they try and shout a question from the back of the room, it will get lost. We won't be able to pick it up on the audio feed. So please do come to the microphone if you have a question. For those of you who are not in the room, if you're viewing from elsewhere, uh, you can text questions to this number. This is Fred's cell phone, and he will field the question to the team. OK, I think that's about it before we launch into the first presentation. So uh, maybe the uh, uh, team from NICE would get themselves together. And I should say, um, this, uh, the team is Paul Jasmine, Jonathan Palmieri, Naomasa Tanaka, and they have been working with Karen McComber at the Nantucket Island Center for Entrepreneurship. And as you can see from the screen, their title of their project is Profiling Businesses on Nantucket. They've been trying to develop from a multiplicity of databases a composite listing uh, of businesses on the island, which, believe it or not, has never been available prior to uh, this time. So over to you guys. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Paul Jasmine. Today I'm presenting with Jonathan Palmieri to my right and Naomasa Tanaka to his right. Uh, the title of our project is Profiling Businesses on Nantucket. We've been working with the Nantucket Island Center for Entrepreneurship, um, also known as NICE. NICE is a subsidiary of the Chamber of Commerce. It was started in 2019 to help promote the growth of new business and entrepreneurship on Nantucket. So we'll start with a little bit of background. So in general, Nantucket experiences a large fluctuation in visitation to the island as a result of tourism in the summer. Um, so this makes, their, uh, makes it such that there's a large fluctuation in the effective population and overall economic activity. As a result, it makes it very difficult to really know how many businesses are operating on the island, when they're operational, and in what sectors are they operating. Um, and when we got started on this, we had very vague or outdated uh, data to go off of. Um, which brings us to our project goal, which was to determine what that inventory or distribution of businesses was by sector um, and to determine sort of uh, what percentage of the overall economy does each sector account for. Um, we were also tasked with understanding the metrics that are used for success by businesses in each sector of the economy. And lastly, to determine what entrepreneurial support can be um, enacted through programs and initiatives by NICE to better support businesses across Nantucket. So to accomplish this, we had uh, three main objectives, the first being benchmarking, um, again, developing that inventory of businesses on the island. Um, we had a best practices component where we were examining some of the common benchmarking tactics that are used elsewhere, uh, other chambers of commerce in Massachusetts and other resort communities. And then lastly, again, uh, understanding what support and initiatives NICE can enact to uh, better assist entrepreneurs on the island. Uh, so with regard to benchmarking, uh, this involved 
identifying and obtaining uh, publicly available economic data on a state and local level, uh, cleaning up that data, and then integrating it into what we're calling a composite business list, or CBL. So that's how we'll be referring to it throughout our presentation. Um, and that is our inventory of businesses that we uh, procured. Um, then we have a best practices component. Uh, this consisted of a literature review, um, but it should, be, it should be noted that we did not hear back from a lot of our interviewees. Um, so this objective ended up kind of taking a back seat um, and fueled a lot of our recommendations. And then lastly, with regard to support and initiatives, um, we conducted a survey that was sent out to all members of the Chamber of Commerce um, and then conducted supplemental interviews with business owners and other stakeholders. All right, so for our CBL, uh we decided to use uh, a combination of getting five different sources of data and merge them into one uh, composite business listing. Those sources of data are PPP loan data, uh, DBA data, alcohol and license data, uh, rock solid grant, and uh, food, food uh, license data. So uh, PPP stands for Payment, uh, Payment Protect, Page, Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and it was given out uh, during COVID-19 to keep people in business. Um, DBA is doing business as, uh, which is run by the town clerk. Um, those are just two acronyms I wanted to make clear. So in all of these sources, there's a bunch of variety of different fields that are present, uh, as you can see on your screen. The one thing that is common across all of them is they all have an address associated with them. We use this address to be able to link these pieces of data together and be able to combine them into singular entries uh, in our database. This is how we took different data sets and were able to merge them together so that we knew that a given all this information was one given business. So to summarize the findings of, of this after we created a composite CBL uh, was that 1175 total businesses were found, uh, which is more than the 726 active members uh, found uh, in the chamber. Um, membership is underrepresented when it comes to construction and landscaping. Um, and NAICS codes is what we use to classify individual businesses. This is a government code uh, that can be used to classify general businesses using the prefix of the NAICS code and very specific what the business does using the longer code itself. Uh, here's a sector breakdown. Uh, if you can draw your attention to the orange where construction is 22% and the blue, which is all services, which makes up 30%, 32%. And this is the breakdown of that service sector again, which again is a bigger breakdown of that 32% portion that was in blue on the previous graph. And here's just some comparisons of chamber membership and our CBL. Uh, again, just looking through some of the numbers, there's sort of a large gap between contractors and construction workers compared to what is represented in the chamber membership, as well as landscaping. Those are the two biggest ones that we saw were underrepresented when it came to our CBL versus chamber membership. So we'll get in a little bit more now into our uh, survey instrument. So basically there were two key components to this. We were trying to ask some quantitative questions to our respondents, understand the relative size of their business through revenue estimates and full and part-time employment estimates. Uh, and then there was more uh, a more subjective component to this as we were asking them about some of the metrics of success that they use to subjectively analyze their own companies. Um, so we'll start just with the, the sectoral distribution of our survey sample. Uh, worth noting is the green section there, the large portion, 24% retail and merchants, and then the blue portion in the bottom left, property and building services, making up 13%. Uh, we separate property and building services from the red all other services section to highlight respondents who operate construction or contracting companies, um, and then note that the other category, the 15% on the bottom, represents everything from salons to barbers to auto repair and things of that nature. So um, with regard to some of the size or quantitative things that we asked about, this is the average annual revenue of survey respondents. Uh, we see a bimodal distribution here as highlighted in red, where about 25% of respondents operate between $50,000 and $200,000 revenue a year, and then 26.5% between the $1 and $5 million a year. Uh, this graph is showing the average range of full-time employment um, across all sectors of our respondents. So it's worth noting here that there, there is, in, in all sectors, some level of full-time employment throughout the entire year. Um, and we see the largest values um, and largest ranges of full-time employment in the food and dining and personal services industries. 
This is that same graph, but now for part-time data. Um, and again, in similar sectors, food, dining, healthcare, and property and building services, we see the largest span of part-time employment. And so realistically, what this tells us, um, in general, part-time employment showed a larger range um, in, in valuation than did full-time employment. And so we can suspect that these companies are either reacting to or gearing up for that massive change in population and economic activity on the island. We asked, uh, among the questions we asked on the survey was whether or not a business was started, inherited, or purchased. We found that 76% of respondents started their business, so we wanted to compare that to uh, a macro scale economic indicator. This is the performance of the S&P 500 from 1945 to present as compared to the number of businesses on Nantucket started um, as dictated to us in our survey. So again, we see a general correspondence here. Um, we have limited data given that there were only 76 responses, um, but we see a general correspondence between economic conditions uh, based on the S&P and the number of businesses started on Nantucket. So in general, we also asked our respondents a little bit about some of the metrics of success that they use uh, to subjectively evaluate their own companies. Um, and most all of our respondents are using monthly data, um, basically evaluating by month to understand how they're doing. And it varies greatly by sector. So a restaurant might be taking the average, uh, average profit per plate average profit per patron, whereas a hotel is probably looking more at um, average profit per room, whereas a construction company is focused much more on the profitability of each individual project. OK. So next, we're going to talk about the support and initiatives that our respondents in survey and uh, interviewees uh, wanted from the Center for Entrepreneurship. So the first type of um, support that they wanted is that they requested for more connections with business services and off-island contractors. And by business services, uh, we mean accountants, lawyers, stuff like that. The second type of support that they requested is for more uh, funding through loans and grants. It's interesting to note that some survey respondents uh, wanted an extended rock solid grant, but some res survey respondents also wanted help actually filling out the grant forms to get grants from other organizations as well. The other responses, respondents also wanted the Center for Entrepreneurship in the chamber to be more involved in business associations, which we'll cover that a bit later. And the final piece of recommendation that we got is for extended uh, mentorship programs for specific skills, such as leadership, marketing, and advertising. There was a strong focus on uh, digital advertising, which was which was pretty interesting as well. So for our final part of our presentation, we're gonna look at the recommendations that we came up with based on our the results from our CBL and from the recommendations from our surveys and interviews. So the first part, first uh, recommendation that we have is to promote the availability of business services. This is, as I covered in the pre previous slide, uh, businesses need more connections to off-island contractors and business services. The second piece of recommendation, the second recommendation that we have is to incorporate more of the construction and landscaping sectors. As Paul said in his section, we noticed a significant underrepresentation of landscaping and construction within the chamber membership. So we recommend that the chamber launch initiatives and try to understand why this ha why this is happening and hopefully incorporate more members into their ranks. The third recommendation that we have is to have an increased mentorship program. This is, as I said, we, I covered this in the previous slide, but uh, for skills such as leadership, mentoring, advertising, and a with a focus on digital advertising, maybe. And the last two recommendations that I have, uh, that we have, are uh, for maintaining and expanding our CBL, first we recommend first we recommend that the Center for Entrepreneurship exp um, maintain their CBL by manually refreshing their data sources every once in a while. For example, the DBA uh, updates every four four years, and um, some of the health licenses updates uh, updates periodically depending on the license. So. Um, and the, expiry, and the expiry date is listed in the license, so the chamber or the entrepreneurship for this or the center for entrepreneurship can go in and update that as they please. 
The last recommendation that we have is to incorporate the data sources that we could not incorporate due to time or technical limitations in this project, such as the phone book and permit records. We do have these two records digitalized, so we do think that it will be not as hard as starting from scratch. Finally, we would like to thank our um, sponsor, Karen McCumber, our faculty advisors, Dominic Golding and Fred Luft. We would like to thank the Nantucket Yacht Club for providing us a place to live. Young's Bicycles for giving us a way to get around the island. Remain Nantucket for fund, uh, for their warm welcome and for funding the Center for Entrepreneurship. And thank you to all the people who we have interviewed. At this point, we'll field some questions. Out of curiosity, uh, based on the data you gathered, do you have an idea of how much turnover is in businesses? How often businesses close or open? Um, so realistically, no, because a majority of the sources that we're looking at were sources that were um, within the last five years time. Um, so we have a good idea, again, as that, that S&P graph showed, we have a good idea of the distribution of businesses started, purchased, inherited since 1945, but it's not really a rolling calculation there. Um, and then we don't really have any idea of how often businesses close down. Um, so a lot of that is going to, as Masa mentioned, come as a result of the reintegration of current data as they expire and get updated. And then as you know, more data is incorporated, you'll get a better understanding of that. Right now, the CBL is more of a, sh a snapshot than a, a, a rolling calculation. Thank you. I would, I would like to add that some of our data sources actually do have legacy um, legacy data. So for example, our license data has um, expired entries as well. We deleted them when we put into CBL, so we won't, we will not see them. But if you review our data sources, you might be able, we might be able to paint a more broad, um, comprehensive picture of that. Nice job, gentlemen. There's a uh, very active builders association and a pretty active landscaping association. Do you think that has an impact on the fact that they're underrepresented in the chamber? because they have their own professional associations? Um, I would make the argument that the lack of involvement from the chamber in those respective organizations is probably where we're seeing the disparity in membership. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's probably something where a lot of those, those respective businesses are joining the Associated Business Association, but maybe don't join the chamber, um, which is part of the reason that we're recommending that the chamber sort of become more involved in those organizations to, um, to have better access to those businesses. Thanks. What we've found in the past is that a lot of our, our um, contractors or people from the, build, the building industry and landscaping industries that um, you have these larger companies that then have their employees as subcontractors. Sure. So then you would have one large organization, but then they have 15 employees and those 15 employees are then subcontractors. How do you find... Um, true existing functioning businesses versus those people who are um, registered as subcontractors for tax purposes or insurance and whatnot. Sure. Um, so that we can then separate those people out to be able to um, better serve that those industries. Sure. So to be quite honest, it's rather difficult to do that. Um, we found we found <laughs> similar issues with uh, licensing and permit industries uh, issues with like the health industry. So, for example, you could have an orthodontist firm that's a licensed, you know, has a license to practice. But each there could be three orthodontists. Each of them have an individual license. So it becomes, unfortunately, very difficult to do that. Um, we we think in general, being able to look at the license data and then associate the address that the license is associated with and group them together. So if you have, you know, four licenses and three of them have just a name associated with it, whereas one of them has a business associated with it and they're all the same address, you can reasonably assume that it's all one business with a, a license for the business and a license for the individual. So we assume that that would be uh, similar for construction, contracting, and landscaping. Okay. And then as far as the survey results, when it comes to um, the, 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 the lack of representation that you mentioned in, in those industries, um, 
have you found any any clear responses as to what exactly those industries are looking for to um, be able to better target? Yeah, them I would start them? by mentioning that we're not 100. We we suspect that our survey results are not completely representative of the chamber okay. or of the overall economy, given that we were only received 72 responses. Um, but with regard to construction companies, a lot of them were corroborating what some of our interviewees said, claimed that more involvement in the in the business associations would be beneficial. Um, and then for a lot of them, their metrics of success are based on the profitability of each project. Um, and so we think that that, you know, that that information can can help the chamber. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Sure. I was just curious if you could put the slides back showing the two pie charts and the table. I mean, they're three different slides, but um, there's a lot of information there and you went through it very quickly. Sure. Um, and on that first one, obviously, you've got construction as a major sector, uh, retail and services. Um, it's probably not a surprise to people who live on the island that that's what the distribution looks like. But I think what your research shows, well, we didn't have these data before. So we had data from the chamber and chamber membership, um, but we and we had some outdated data from, you know, like the master plan, uh, master plan from yep. 2009. But it's actually very difficult to get. It, it, it's surprising why it would be so difficult to get these data. Right. Um, and what do you think you'd have done if the, we hadn't had COVID and the PPP loan scheme? I think you would see a significantly smaller total of businesses in the CBO. Um, ironically, that the PPP loans ended up being the largest contributor to our CBL. Um, and in a weird way, without COVID, this project really would not have been possible or uh, we would not have had uh, this distinct of a result in comparison to previous data. Yeah, I think uh, social scientists are, are, are actually rubbing their hands at all that COVID's done for us because there's going to be all sorts of data sets that people are going to be analyzing for years, as, uh, as crass as that might sound. Does anybody else have any other questions? And Fred, do we have any questions texted? Sarah, you want to come over and ask your question? Hi, thank you. Um, I just wondered if you collected any demographic information associated with the businesses. So that could the chamber use the data to look at you know, women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses. Sure. So uh, the, the SBA in their database, uh, so the, the PPP data, um, we've provided in our CBL a link to every SBA entry into that database, and they collect a lot of demographic data. Um, we, in our research, did not. Um, but the SBA, so the, the PPP is a major portion of the CBL, uh, making up about 700 of the 1,100 entries. Um, so we suspect that that is most likely representative of the distribution of demographics among the entire economy. And so we recommend that um, if that's a topic of interest, the chamber can look through the SBA database and extract that information. Thank you. OK, well, thank you, John, Paul, Massa. Nice presentation, and uh, I think uh, we have to move on to keep trying to keep on track. So next up will be the uh, team working with uh, the Linda Loring. So whilst they get themselves set up, I will try and do an introduction without uh, messing up. Um, so the team members are Delaney Cox, Iris Moran, Jane Richardson. And, Desmond. and they've been working for the last seven weeks, well, really the last 14 weeks. You might want to select your presentation here. Um, so they've been working on Ireland for the last seven weeks and then seven weeks prior to that uh, doing the prep. Uh, they've been working with uh, Kitty Pockman, Sarah Boys, and Seth Engelberg at the Linda Loring Nature Foundation. And they've been looking at... Um, of the perspectives on the Linda Loring's uh, planned master plan or master planning process. So they will report back on what they've discovered as soon as they can get their presentation up on the screen. There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. We're the Linda Loring Nature Foundation IQP group. Uh, I'm Delaney Cox. I'm Iris Morin. I'm Jane Richardson. And I'm Desmond Woodson. 
And so just to start off, the Linda Loring Nature Foundation was founded by Linda Loring in 1999 to preserve and protect open space, wildlife, plants, and their natural habitats in the ecosystem for public purpose. In cooperation with the LNF, uh, the overall goal of our project was to solicit stakeholder input um, on how the LNF should utilize the entirety of their property in regards to their draft master plan in order to maximize community engagement with their programs and their property. To ensure that we were completely prepared to achieve this project goal, our first objective was to assess how the LNF imp uh, implemented their strategic goals of stewardship, research, and education through its various programs and activities. This was done by learning about the foundation through tours of their property, conversations with their sponsor, and we also got to experience a program firsthand by participating in their annual Trails and Treats event to get a better understanding of how programs are run and how the staff interacts with the public. For our second objective, we solicited stakeholder opinions in relation to the purpose, content, and future implementations of the LNF's draft master plan. This was done by interviewing key individuals as well as sharing a survey around the island to nine stakeholder groups so that we could determine what aspects of the LNF's mission the community values most. In objective three, we identified how different organizations operate in the role of environmental conservation and preservation in Nantucket. We did this in three tasks. First, we did background research on each organization, followed by interviews with key staff representatives. We also conducted self-guided tours on example properties owned by each of these organizations, in which we created a comparison table of observations such as seating options, parking lot capacities, and signage types. Based on our findings from objectives one through three, we reviewed the content, structure, and purpose of the LNF's draft master plan by accumulating the results, reevaluating the master plan as it stands, and finally creating the necessary recommendations. So one of the main ways that we solicited responses from these key stakeholder groups was through a survey, and we, see, we received a total of 209 responses. Up on the screen now, you can see the results from when we asked these respondents to identify their familiarity with the Linda Loring Nature Foundation, and about 50% of them responded saying that they visited the property more than once, while about 29% said that they've heard of the foundation but have never actually visited the property. And so up on this slide, we have the results from when we asked respondents to prioritize potential additions to the property. Out of a total of 150 people, 109 or about 72% responded that they wanted importance placed on new trails. And that's indicated both in the light pink and purple colors on the bars. Additions that respondents also wanted to see included viewing platforms and additional benches and picnic tables around the property. On this slide, we have the results from when we asked respondents to do the same thing, but with interpretive materials around the property. And one thing we found was that the respondents really wanted to see the addition of physical signage, or I'm sorry, not physical signage. Um, they wanted to see trail markers, informational descriptions of flora and fauna, and then different markers for points of interest around the property. So now up on this slide is where you can see where respondents preferred to see physical signage around the property rather than the use of QR codes, a downloadable app, or even paper handouts. And then finally on this slide, we just have some key quotes that we pulled from the survey, which kind of encompass some of the thoughts that respondents were saying. So the first one says, just knowing what's available would be of most importance, and this is in correlation to programming and communication. The next one is geared more towards the interpretive materials and says signage is minimal. More signage would allow for more self-guided tours and learning. And finally, the last one lends itself to accessibility and states, I have mobility issues. Are there modifications for disabled people? So one focus when comparing the properties on Nantucket owned by different organizations was types of trails. First, you will see a wide level and well-maintained grass trail found at the LNF's property and at Sanford Farms. During our walks, however, we found that Sanford Farms and the dirt and gravel trails at Tuppence Links would occasionally be overworn and uneven, and we thought this was due to the property's popularity. Despite this, we found that these trails were reasonably suitable for many users. However, it was only the land bank's newly opened Creeks Preserve that fully accommodated things such as wheelchairs and strollers with their fully paved walking paths. When comparing the interpretive materials at these various 
properties, we identified that the LNF's kiosk is just as informative as those at the, um, excuse me, the Conservation Foundation's properties. Both kiosks include a property map, key species, habitat types, and prohibitive activities. The two foundations, however, took different approaches when providing resources in different languages. The NCF translated their kiosk into Spanish on the backside, while the LLNF had a page with six different QR codes for different languages of versions of their brochures. Uh, as for signage, we found that the wooden markers at the LNF both fit their conservation restrictions while also fitting the aesthetic of their property. The NCF took a different approach at Squam Swamp with uh, more visible markers for that particular property setting. Uh, they also use informational plaques to inform users about the flora and fauna along with um, or along the trails, um, while the LNF used uh, numbered posts that corresponded with an informational brochure. Between our property visits, our team conducted interviews with people around Nantucket to gain a better insight into aspects of our project. One such interview was with a senior board member of the LNF, which provided a better understanding of the board's perspective of the draft master plan from its creation through its final outcome. The interview also helped highlight the potential need for additional staff uh, positions at the LNF and the recommendation of a new student biology program. Isaac Hirsch shared his positive experience as a former LNF intern, his insights into housing on Nantucket, the foundations offered programs and activities, and the need for community outreach directly fueled our recommendations on these topics. Our next interview had been with Matt Little, who provided us with great insight from the perspective of an education collaborator. Matt is a current teacher at the Nantucket New School, as well as a past board, board member of the Linda Loring Nature Foundation itself. Matt spoke very highly of the, part of the programs he and his students have participated in with the Linda Loring Nature Foundation. He had mentioned hopes of potential new additions at the property, such as a dock, for aquatic programs, along with the possibility of a research and education facility, which he felt would completely separate the foundation from others alike. Matt, however, did also touch upon accessibility at the property, finding it to be a barrier due of entry due to the fact that a bus just logistically cannot enter the property with the current configuration of the entrance and parking lot. In order to get um, another perspective on accessibility um, and how it could be implemented at the LNF, we spoke to uh, Mickey Rowland and Brenda McDonough from the Nantucket Commission on Disability. We primarily discussed which conservation organization properties were the most accessible, and they told us about Creeks Preserve, which was previously mentioned, and that, that property was made um, with a primary focus on accessibility, so they recommended that it would be a good property for us to go tour. We also spoke with R.J. Turcott, the resource ecologist at the Nantucket Land Council, uh, he gave us a lot of comparative insight on how a different conservation organization on Nantucket operates and functions. Due to his area of expertise, he was able to list possible new ideas for educational and research programs the LNF could implement at their new parcel of land. Um, and our final interview was with Rachel Freeman, the environmental and agricultural coordinator at the Nantucket Land Bank. This interview gave us yet another perspective on the inner workings of a different conservation organization that we could then compare to the LNF. From these findings, we have developed a list of recommendations for the Linda Loring Nature Foundation. Our first being that we recommend they prioritize these potential actions of the master plan as shown. Based on survey results specifically, respondents shown higher interest in new trails, viewing platforms, along with benches and picnic tables. From interview findings with stakeholders, they place heavy emphasis on the development of a research and education facility. In correlation to these actions, a bridge to connect their new parcel would also be of high priority. The next actions falling into intermediate priority based on survey responses were research and intern housing, outdoor classrooms, more signage, and a pond dock. Then falling into the lower priority category where was additional parking, eye level features, along with wildlife blinds. These presented actions are only potential ideas depending on the interests of, of the Linda Loring Nature Foundation, but they can utilize this information as to what new features may bring in higher community engagement with the property. Next, we recommend updating and adding physical signage. As preferred by those who took the survey, it would consist of trail markers, informational descriptions of flora and fauna, along with potential uh, points of interest and scenic vista markers. Though, 
Though there are limitations on signage with conservation restrictions, even minor changes would make the difference for user interaction of the property. Our next recommendation would be hiring a land maintenance <coughs> staff, staff member. The foundation, uh, the foundation currently maintains its property with primarily two staff members and the assist of volunteers and landscape contractors for bigger duties. The visual on the left represents the foundation's original 105-acre property prior to the new addition as highlighted in yellow. The visual on the right outlines a new addition in blue, which increased the property to 275 acres, which is more than double the original size. This recommendation is meant to free up the time of other staff, me staff members, such as Sarah and Seth, allowing them to focus on research and programming, along with eliminating the need for a landscape contractor to carry out maintenance work. Next, our next category for recommendation is accessibility. We recommend expanding the parking lot entrance or adding an entrance loop, which would, uh, which would accommodate two larger vehicles to access the property with ease, such as buses. Next, we recommend creating a handicapped parking spot to better accommodate, the, uh, to better accommodate for those with ambulatory disabilities. Following that, we recommend creating an all access trail. This trail will consist of a stone dust surface with no slopes greater than 5% for mobility purposes, along with a rope and post system, which could assist those with visual impairments. Uh, following that, we, uh, we, sorry. we understand that with these recommendations, as previously mentioned, that they can't all be feasible due to some of the conservation restrictions that they have on the property. So we also recommend developing a virtual trail tour so those who cannot make it out to the property can still experience and enjoy the property just from a different perspective. From our interviews with Turcotte and the senior LNF board member, we've compiled a list of new educational and research programs the LNF can now implement with the new addition of their property. For education, the LNF should open their property for more collaborative programs with other conservation organizations. Possible programs include vernal pool tours, additional kayak tours, and other aquatic educational programs in general. For research, possible opportunities are monitoring the effects of climate change on aquatic species, collecting data on pond water quality, and an increase in invasive species monitoring. Finally, we recommend increasing the outreach and visibility in the community. This can be done by better promoting the foundation's social media presence and increasing the amount of advertisements that are put out. Along with this, the foundation should run programs more frequently to better accommodate for those with busy schedules who cannot attend now but wish to as portrayed by comments from the survey responses. On top of this, we suggest the foundation run more larger scale events than it typically does, such as trails and treats, as it tends to introduce people to the property more. So just as a disclosure, we wanted to say that the previous recommendations are only suggestions on our part to the Linda Loring Nature Foundation in regard to their draft master plan. What they wish to do with these and how they want to implement them is completely up to them and the board. And any further information on these recommendations can also be found in our final report. So just before we wrap up, we wanted to thank our sponsors, Sarah Boys, Seth Engelborg, Kitty Pochman, Kristen Bullitt, and then our advisors, Dominic Golding, Fred Luke, and all of the key respondents from our studies, such as the LLNF senior board member, RJ Turcott, Matt Little, Isaac Hirsch, Mickey Rowland, Brenda McDonough, and Rachel Freeman. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions at this time? I guess I could ask a rude question. So, um, have you got a budget? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that, that's going to depend on which actions they decide to carry out. Uh, so that will obviously depend on their budget, and they will probably have to go on a capital campaign to get those resources. Yeah, I mean, some of the things that you're talking about are obviously uh, pretty sizable contribution. I mean, pretty sizable dollar figures that you're looking at, but that's obviously part of the reason for the master plan. I don't know, is Sarah still, Sarah, did you want, or Seth, do you want to, uh, do you want to get up and make a response of any sort? Institutional uh, rejoinder? I thought they did great. Yeah. Thanks. So I have a question. How would any of your suggestions change or be modified based on sea level rise? 
Definitely new trails would have to be taken into consideration with that. Uh, obviously with the new parcel of land, you have wetlands on that side, which are set to be underwater by 2100. Uh, so that would probably change just location factors of some of these recommendations. Uh, so that would be hopefully be taken into account prior to where they decide to put in for building envelopes with permit wise and everything. The dock would also be affected by that because it's on the water. So <laughs> I'm curious too. Uh, this is the first project we've done with Linda Loring uh, Foundation. Uh, I'm just curious what your what 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 surprised you being on island, touring these properties, seeing how a foundation like this works. What were what were sort of some of the things you expected and some of the things you didn't expect, perhaps. I guess I'll take that one to start. Uh, personally, I know back home, kind of like conservation places aren't that big. So I was kind of surprised to see how big it is on the island and how serious they take it. So I thought that was pretty cool uh, getting to see how they operate, how they run, what goes into it all. So I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. One thing that definitely surprised me was <clears throat> the number of organizations that are similar to that of LNF. It, Nantucket's not a very big island, but I think there's around 10 organizations that are somewhat similar or own land. Um, and that, that really surprised me. And they all operate slightly differently as well. Yeah, to kind of add on to what Desmond was saying, like back home, if I think of a conservation land, I think of a lot of trees and a forest usually. But I feel like out here, there's a lot more open fields and a lot more diverse species out there that I wouldn't necessarily see anywhere else. Yeah, the amount of protected open space on Nantucket was surprising. I didn't think there'd be this much. I think in regards to Linda Loring specifically, I think with them, definitely the land, uh, just the way they operate it, they don't do too much with it. They have certain aspects that keep it in proper shape, and it's really cool to see that. No more questions. Thank you, team, for your presentation. <laughs> yes, next up is the team who've been working with the Department of Public Works and uh, been working with uh, Graham Durovich at the DPW and Holly Backus uh, uh, Preservation Manor uh, with the Plus. And uh, the team, whilst they get themselves sorted out, uh, is uh, Abby Kalistra, Jacob Misbach, Heather Oxford, and Tony Violo. And as I say, they've been working with Graham and Holly, uh, and they've been looking at uh, basically ways to try and reduce the amount of waste that goes into the landfill, waste from historic buildings that are being demolished, uh, reconstructed, remodeled, uh, whatever various term you want to use. And so uh, I'll hand it over to them. Oh uh, yeah, so good afternoon everybody. I'm Jacob Misbach. I'm Abby Kloestro. I'm Heather Oxford. Tony Bolo. And as Dominic said, we've been working on a project in conjunction with the DPW and several other organizations to look at how to reduce um, construction and demolition waste going into landfills and being just wasted in general. So in order to accomplish our project, we identified three main objectives. The first being to look at the current C&D waste uh, policies on Nantucket. We looked at the landfill, other ways that waste is handled. Then we evaluated waste practices outside of Nantucket, looking at communities that um, Nantucket could model after. And finally, we looked at incentives that can be used to reduce C&D waste. So for some background on this topic, within the US, um, approximately 67% of all waste is from construction and demolition projects. This is about 600 million tons compared to less than 300 million tons that come from municipal solid waste. And of this um, 600 million tons of construction and demolition waste, the majority is coming from demolitions. So that's why we're tackling that side of the um, problem. For Nantucket specifically, the majority of waste is sent off island. So it gets loaded into the CND building at the uh, DPW landfill, which you can see in the picture here, loaded onto a trailer and then shipped off island. Um, as you can see in the picture, there's a lot of material that's getting wasted. So there's a lot of wood and other things that could be used again, but instead it's getting sent to a landfill and 
just destroyed. So most of our data we gathered from interviews. The there we go. Most of our data we gathered from interviews um, from several organizations, both government independent. You can see their logos up on the screen. Uh, for each of them, we inquired about a variety of different topics. We talked about current policies and approvals with the Historic District Commission. We talked with Toscana, the Building Association, as well as Housing Nantucket for um, their roles in deconstruction, demolition, and just al alternative demolition practices. We talked about land allocation with the Land Bank and the Affordable Housing Trust. We talked about education with the Historical Commission and the Nantucket Preservation Trust, as well as the Association of Real Estate Brokers. And we also uh, asked about possibilities regarding uh, incentives to pursue alternatives to demolition with the Coastal Resilience Team. Now. What we've actually found from these organizations um, drove a lot of our recommendations, which we will present momentarily. The first item that we discovered is that there is no physical market for salvage building materials on the island. The closest facility that we found to fulfill that purpose would be the take it or leave it, which does not accept building materials, which is a problem. Now, a lot of builders, um, a great example would be from the Builders Association, their representative, have been collecting salvaged materials such as wood from deconstruction that could be used in the future to, to fund a market. Now, we also took a look at data from the HDC to like the, about the number of demolitions total and partial that have occurred over a like recent time span. So here we have 125 such projects since 2019 displayed on a GIS data layer used that we combined using HDC demolition data and uh, tax parcels. Now the another item that we looked at was public interest in actually restoring these historic homes. And we found a number of examples. The Nantucket Preservation Trust that I referenced previously, they do house tours of for historic homes, and they actually rank each house based on the amount of uh, material that's actually in the amount of original material from the houses when the house was first built the for realtor licenses uh, there are locally there are classes that are locally available where you can actually get some historical context learn how to approach selling a historic house to clients uh, our team had the privilege of talking to sarah mclean who is restoring a house on goal island goal island lane um, we went over a number of different strategies for restoring the inside of the house. She talked to us about how she's trying to like restore the windows and if not using salvage windows to replace them, she's in total uh, saved about 50 from the dump. Uh, we talked about how her donations of unneeded materials like beams to other construction projects and just in general, keeping the original layout of the interior of the house in mind while she works through the restoration. The one of the last items that we looked at was a demolition delay. Now, with um, when with demolitions on the island, there is a certain time period that a that a municipal administration can sort of administer on the people where if you want to demolish a house, you have to wait a certain period of time. You have to do some research, figure out if there is any sort of historical context that you need to be worried about and also find a place to relocate the house if that's an available alternative. Now, the that time period on Nantucket is currently 30 to 60 days, which is long enough to look up historical context, but not long enough to do relocations. For the record, most places with such a delay have a delay of six to 18 months. From those findings, the following are our recommendations for various organizations on Nantucket. Our first recommendation is the creation of a curricula 
for realtors, architects, and builders, respectively, um, that it will encourage more sustainable practices. This will be done, hopefully, by the HDC in conjunction with organizations like the Nantucket Association of Real Estate Brokers and the Nantucket Builders Association. For a, realtor, a realtor's curriculum, the main focus is marketing the historical elements that can be identified in homes to prospective buyers and encouraging the saving and preserving of these elements. For architects, the curriculum should be about highlighting the historic elements in design and encouraging the use of, ori the use of more original material. While for builders, these courses can be distributed by the MBA as shown in the picture above. They already offer courses to their members, but a separate course on deconstruction can be um, created and an expert can be brought in to help um, clear up that issue, like clear up the nature of what deconstruction is and how it's different than demolition. Our next recommendation is the creation of a program to increase public awareness of the historic tax credit. There are businesses and homeowners on the island who have received the historic tax credit. However, the process is lengthy and expensive. Um, the building up here is the Nantucket Hotel. They have received this credit. Um, however, to create a program that would increase the ease and awareness of public for the benefits of the historic tax credit, it would be um, helpful in maintaining historic um, structures on the island. Our next uh, recommendation is requiring homeowners to submit a deposit with um, the receipt of a COA, which is a certificate of appropriateness that is required for any construction project. Um, the deposit would be returned to the owner of the homeowner upon the completion of the project. Uh, if the standards that the HGC has laid out are met for historic restoration and C&D waste reduction. If these standards are not met, then that money would go towards housing organizations on Nantucket, like the Affordable Housing Trust. Our next recommendation is the creation of a COA review priority system for quicker approval of sustainable practices like restoration, relocation, and deconstruction over projects that generate more waste, like renovation and demolition. This will provide a timely incentive for homeowners to want to deconstruct over demolish their home and therefore create less waste. Our next recommendation is that the town work with the HDC to amend the current demolition delay bylaws. Currently, if a homeowner wants to get rid of a structure on their property, they only have to wait a maximum of 60 days before they can be issued a demolition permit for that structure. Those, those 60 days are not enough time for other members of the community to hear about the structure, find a new location to put the structure, and then actually move that structure to that new location. Most other towns in Massachusetts that have demo delay bylaws have demo delay periods of at least six months, sometimes up to 18 months. So a change in Nantucket's demo delay period to something within that range would help to reduce the number of houses that are being demolished. We also recommend that the DPW facilitate the creation of a physical marketplace for salvage building materials. Nantucket builders already have their own stockpiles of salvaged building materials from the different projects that they work on, but currently there's no way for anybody else in the general public to access any of those stockpiles or any of those resources. The DPW could set aside some space at the landfill for the creation of a salvage materials store similar to a Habitat for Humanity restore. People could bring in salvage building materials that they no longer need, and then the store could resell those to people who are looking to use salvage building materials in their projects. This would divert a lot of the salvage materials from going straight to the landfill. We recognize that finding available space on Nantucket can be a real challenge. So if a physical marketplace for salvage materials would not be feasible, then we recommend the town facilitate the creation of an online resource for salvage building materials. Many marketplaces like this already exist, such as Facebook Marketplace or Nantucket Reuse Exchange, but there's no formal online place for Nantucket-specific salvage building material exchange. Creating this online resource would allow more people access to these materials and, again, would help divert a lot of those materials from going straight into the landfill. Along similar lines, we recommend that the 
town and the HCC work together to create an online resource for structures being advertised for relocation. Currently, the only advertising that's required when a homeowner wants to get rid of a structure from their property is the homeowner has to put an ad in the local newspaper stating that the structure is up for relocation and any interested party should contact the homeowner. But this ad doesn't necessarily reach as many people as a central online resource could. The town could keep an active record of all structures that are currently available for relocation so that anybody in the community who's looking for a structure could go to one central online location and see everything that's currently available. This would help reduce the number of houses that are being demolished. As I mentioned earlier, it can be very challenging to find available space on Nantucket, and this lack of space causes a real problem for people who want to relocate structures. Right now, for the most part, if somebody wants to relocate a structure, they have to have the new location already set up and ready to go to receive the structure because the relocation process has to be done within those 60 days before the demolition delay runs out. We recommend that the town modify the ground cover policies oh well, to allow for temporary staging of structures on properties. And if possible, we also recommend that the town allocate some land to be used as an interim space to store these structures while a more permanent location is being found for them. Doing these things would take a lot of the pressure off of those who are trying to relocate structures because it would give them more time to figure out all the logistics of actually moving that structure. And in doing so, this would decrease the number of houses that are being demolished. So there are several areas of future research that we have identified um, in the, in, through, going out, through going through our project. The first being um, there should be a project that analyzes transportation routes commonly used for relocating structures. Uh, so in talking with individuals on the island, we learned that there are many obstacles like power lines and narrow roads, things of that nature, which make it difficult to move structures. So this team could go through, look at common root, co routes commonly used to move structures, figure out should the power lines be moved underground, could roads be expanded, things of that nature, which would make it easier and more feasible to move more structures. Additionally, with the contract um, that the DBW has with its with waste options, the um, waste management company that it uses uh, expiring in 2025. There's room for some negotiation uh, to add maybe an additional waste stream or have the new contractor run a facility, something of that nature, which a future project team could explore and provide recommendations on. Lastly, in conjunction with an organization such as the MPT, um, a guide could be created which would educate homeowners on their, the historical value of their homes as well as the value of materials on their homes so that they know what's being lost when a home is demolished. And before we wrap up, we just wanna acknowledge some people who took time and helped us with our project, including our sponsors, Graham Dervich and Holly Backus, our advisors, Dominic Golding and Fred Luft, the 17 people who agreed to, we, who agreed to sit down with us and Nantucket Yacht Club and Young's Bicycles for providing us with housing and um, trans transportation. Thank you. Any questions? Let's go. We nailed it. Do we have any questions? Colleen, Graham, do you want to uh, add anything to what the students no, already I said? So. Um, you did a great job. Thank you. Um, I think it's quite irrelevant. I think you're contextualizing this for people. Um, so the challenge is one of the transportations of P and G going off island, and that's three trucks going off every single day on the boat. So that's really valuable boat space. And you can also think about that stuff needing to come here in the first place, or whenever it's going to place that. So just to have a better understanding of the time that we're talking about here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. So did you look into or, or um, talk to the HDC about, so when they allow the demolition permit, mm -hmm. have they already viewed what is proposed to be replacing that structure? Like, is there any sort of connection between the two? So from Holly shaking her head, no. <laughs> um, so there, there's no review as to what's going to be replacing it. It's just what is, what is there right now 
is it historically relevant? If it's not, then it can be demolished. If it is, then how do we handle that? Gotcha. So there's no tie, like anything. Okay, yeah, cool. I mean, cool question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. I just want to thank you very much for all of your work this semester and um, look forward to seeing you another group. There's always more work to be done. Um, I'm curious, I'll ask you what, what I asked the previous team. So, you know, this is not anything you'd probably even thought about before you started this project. Um, Although I know Heather has lived in an old house and suffered through that, like many of us who've lived in old houses. It's both a suffering and a joy, obviously. Um, but I'm curious what, what, what really stands out, what surprised you in the course of your project, um, you know, when you came to Ireland and you really dug into this topic? Yeah, I guess, at least personally, um, the thing that surprised me was just the prevalence of structures actually being moved. You know, I've never seen that before, at least in person. Um, so having structures getting lifted, moved, even Holly talking about the shed that she might move. So just knowing that that's actually something that happens was a surprise to me. Yeah, I'd say going off that, just like the amount of people looking into the alternatives of demolition and using the, them consistently is was surprising to me. I think, and to sort of add on to that, um, if there's one thing that, I, I mean, surprises me about literally everything, so I can't say it applies specifically to this project, but just the expanse, like, all of, I guess, all the people we talk to, just understanding every single organization and every little aspect, every single person who's invested, like, in this issue in some regard was, was kind of amazing to me. I didn't realize it would go as, like, as far branch out as far as it would but yeah i would say one of the things that was su most surprising to me was yeah how often house moves happen but also just how often new structures are put in place on the same location like only a couple years apart there's so much being built being taken down to be replaced with something else it was like i that just doesn't happen in a lot of other places i feel i feel like people usually have structures in that spot for a little while, and then it gets redone, but things just get redone so fast. And in such a short amount of time too, because you don't have a lot or any maybe construction going on during like summer months and stuff when it's a big tourist attraction and then everything just gets done really fast over the off season, which is kind of impressive. That's a lot of work to be done in such, such a short amount of time. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, so for the people that you talk to that maybe weren't necessarily um, utilizing the restoration or old materials and stuff like that. Did you find that there was a common theme as to why they were choosing not to do that? Yeah, so a lot of the problems that we saw were just that it was a time thing. Um, so people have so much money on the island that it really doesn't matter how what the cost is to them. Um, so they just want things done as fast as possible and restorations take a long time. Sarah said that she's like two years deep into this. Um, and that's unacceptable to, you know, some people who are building houses. So they just want things done fast um, and don't really care about the cost, whether it be like energy wise or financially. Okay. Well, thank you team. Thank you. So while the next team get themselves sorted out, I'll do a brief introduction. So uh, this team has been working with uh, Remain, uh, and the team comprises uh, Keith DeSantis, Garrett Devlin, Alicia Salvalzo, and Blaise Schroeder. Uh, they've been working with uh, Cecil Baron Jensen, Jen King, Rachel Hobart, and Vina Gonzalez at Remain. And as the title on the screen shows, they've been looking at small-scale off-grid solar. We know lots about, uh, you know, expansion of uh, residential solar uh, photovoltaics, solar panels on Nantucket, um, but they were looking in particular at smaller-scale off-grid solar. 
So over to you. Okay, uh, hello everyone. We are the Remain Nantucket IQP group and our product was Off-Grid Solar. I'm Keith DeSantis. I'm Garrett Devlin. I'm Alicia Salvazzo. And my name is Blaze Schroeder. So to start off with our project goal and overview, our project statement was to evaluate the feasibility of small scale off-grid solar applications on the island of Nantucket. So just a little background to look at large scale versus small scale solar installations. Here on the left is actually a house on Nantucket with a larger scale solar PV array mounted on the roof of the household. This array is tied to Nantucket's electric grid. So any extra energy produced is fed back and all energy is used to power the house. However, on the other side, we have an application that is seating with a charging station for users and it has a small solar um, array built into the umbrella of the table but this application is not connected to the grid in any way and is self-sustainable. So looking at our objectives, um, objective one was to review current practices, whether this be on island or in similar communities, looking at installations that already exist. Our second objective was to evaluate the barriers and incentives of installing solar. So um, incentives like solar rebates and grants or barriers such as um, a high cost or the historic district commission approval process. Our third objective was to assess the benefits and limitations of each applications. Um, if an application could provide a positive impact on the community or limitations such as a high price range. And our fourth objective was to provide promotional and informational guides that give a quick overview of each of the applications that we researched um, to distribute for uh, various purposes. So looking a little bit into our methodology development and um, how we attacked the goal of our project. So we started with researching and developing um, our research proposal. While we were doing this, we looked at various um, case studies. So on the picture on the left, you can see um, this is actually a bus shelter on island and has a small sol solar pergola array on top of the overhang that powers the light inside of the bus shelter. Then uh, once we got to island, we conducted many interviews with key stakeholders, such as local solar installer, Axmart, which can be seen in the middle here at the corner table, um, looking at a pergola that they are planning to install solar on. And then from there, we moved on to a public survey to solicit public opinion on solar, as well as uh, four of our key applications. And here's a picture on the right of some survey results. So moving on to our main interview findings, uh, our first one had to do with grid impact and public relations. So from our research, we learned that PV installations on island have been increasing in recent years, as you can see from this figure. Uh, but this is solely tracking residential lar or commercial larger scale systems. And while the smaller off-grid systems that we are researching are not likely to have much of an effect on the grid, uh, that's not to say they're without merit. Uh, from what we heard in interviews and what we researched, it seems that smaller scale off-grid applications could be an invaluable tool for public relations and education and adoption of solar. Nantucket is a very tightly knit community, one where these kind of applications could be a great proof of concept that solar has a diversity of uses uh, that wouldn't necessarily cause an eyesore. Although some of the installations that we're talking about may face, or may face some pushback concerning aesthetics. Uh, our second interview takeaway had to do with regulations and jurisdiction. So we interviewed members of the Historic District Commission, or HDC, uh, as well as other stakeholders who had interacted with them. And their goal is to preserve the historic character of the island, so they approve or deny all applications for solar arrays on houses. Um, and their jurisdiction is over architectural features that are visible from a publicly traveled way. So this historic building would probably be uh, denied if they tried to put solar panel on the roofs here. But a key point of their jurisdiction is that it does not cover mobile applications, which are a lot of the smaller off-grid kind of things we're looking at. So things that it can be disassembled or put back up would not necessarily need HDC approval. Um, and another point to make is that while the HDC's, HDC's goal is to preserve aesthetic, they are not at all against solar. In fact, in recent years, as solar has become more popular, their whole um, approach to applications has evolved as both all parties involved have worked to find a compromise between preserving that aesthetic and moving the island forward in terms of sustainability. 
So our final interview takeaway had to do with technical limitations. Uh, a lot of the things that we're gonna go over and look at are pre-built systems like trash compactors or generators that all come in one package, but some are more customizable. So this is the solar pergola outside a corner table ta cafe that Remain Nantucket and Act Smart are working together to put panels on for lighting and other applications. Um, when it comes to these systems, it is preferable to have an entirely new installation when you're going off grid instead of rewiring the current grid tied uh, system to go onto solar panels and batteries and things like that. And uh, the final thing that we took from technical limitations was from our interview with Lawrence Sinatra of the Nantucket Energy Office that Nantucket's grid infrastructure is reaching its solar capacity limit in terms of the amount of systems it can hold. So this gives off-grid systems a unique advantage in that they could continue the momentum of solar installation on island without uh, contributing to that issue. So on to our public survey results. So our survey was formatted into two main parts. The first part was general solar opinions, where we asked residents on questions on the importance of the aesthetic of Nantucket. We asked questions on how much they think solar power should be encouraged on the island. And we asked if, where, at all, uh, solar panels could be easily visible, where would it most detriment uh, the aesthetic of Nantucket? And this led into the second part of the survey, which was the application assessment, where we asked residents their opinions on four of our applications, those being the trash compactor, the charging station, the charging locker, and the information kiosk. And each uh, application had a section asking on the favorability of each uh, project, uh, the rated use, so how much Nantucket, Nantucketers think that they would use this, and how much they think the public would use this. So the first question that we asked in the opening section would be, the preservation of Nantucket's historic aesthetic is important to me, and both full-time and seasonal residents rated it as strongly important to them. And this shows up in our next question, which is the adoption of solar power should be more encouraged on Nantucket where both full-time and seasonal respondents said that they both agree, or strongly agree, that uh, solar power should be more encouraged. The next question that we asked was, I believe solar panels should not be easily visible in downtown Nantucket. And here we see a split in the full-time residents where they are mostly average out to a neutral stance. However, there's a wide variety of opinions, whereas there's a um, strong left tail on the seasonal residents in which most of them strongly agree or agree with the statement that there shouldn't be easily visible solar panels in the downtown area. However, in the next question, which is, I believe solar panels should not be easily visible outside of downtown and Sconset, we see the opposite, where the full-time residents say in a right-tailed skew that, no, they strongly disagree. It's, it's okay to have uh, easily visible solar panels outside of the two historic core zones, whereas the seasonal residents are mostly split between themselves. So moving on to the applications on the survey, uh, a quick note to make is that a lot of these smaller scale applications can come in many different sizes and shapes. And due to the limited format of a survey, we were only able to show one picture, short description. So the pictures we chose may have biased some of the results. Um, and we'll be discussing key takeaways, but if there are any questions about how we got the data or the takeaways that we have. We have the graphs and we'll be happy to discuss it later. So the first one uh, was solar powered trash compactors and these were by far the highest uh, favorability on the survey. Uh, the image you see is some compactors that are already on island. Uh, both seasonal and full-time respondents showed very little or low aesthetic impact concerns and there was positive feedback across all residency groups. And the second application we looked at was phone charging stations, and these were the second highest favorite application beneath the trash compactors that we just spoke about. So on the left, you see a solar charging station that is a table. So the panel is actually integrated into the umbrella that is above the table with the seats beneath it. And this was the one picture we included on the survey, but there are also smaller portable applications that could be moved from location to location. So this could combat the visual concerns that survey respondents did mention. And also the seasonal residents did express a phone usage concern. So they felt that these charging stations would actually encourage the usage of cell phone usage on the island when these seasonal residents do come here to enjoy Nantucket's historical aesthetic. So they do see that this could be an issue. The third application that we pulled on our survey was informational kiosks. Here on the left, the image that is shown is a mock-up of what a kiosk may look like on Nantucket to further fit the aesthetic. 
in the middle is a picture of kiosks in the Metropolitan Transit Authority subway stations in New York City that provide some infographics to passersby as well as the weather and when their train is coming. We found that these were in a very favored application. Only about 30% of uh, survey respondents said that they were in favor of their implementation or that they would find them convenient and would use them. Uh, one of the reasons we attribute this to the usage of cell phones, most people these days have cell phones that they can easily search up this information on that they um, require. But we do believe that these informational kiosks can be implemented in specialty uses, such as uh, making them portable and placing them outside historic buildings and areas to provide factual information to passersby. And the final application that we looked at would be charging lockers. These would be placed on beaches where you'd be able to open up a locker for the day, plug your phone in, store items that you might not want to carry onto the sand, go out to the beach, come back, and your phone's charged and all your items are there. These unfortunately had the lowest favorability out of all of the four applications that we assessed. There were significant aesthetic concerns because of how big and bulky it was and how it might ruin the aesthetic and looks of the beach and besides that a lot of the residents stated that they themselves and that they believed that the nantucket public would not use these as often as we initially thought they might we also attribute a lot of these survey responses to the fact that these were all residents answered and a lot of these applications would be used by visitors so there are several other applications that we looked into that we want to make mention of. These include outdoor lighting, the solar generators that are towable, parking meters, and golf carts with solar panels on top or through a different charging method. So moving on to our informational and promotional guides. Here is a quick example of one of them, and they include uh, various points of information. So if we look at the top third of the guide, we can see the name of the application, a depiction of the application, and a short description to uh, let the user know what its purpose is. Then moving down, we have uh, various locations that we believe these applications would be beneficial in, uh, where they may be better to be placed, as well as a pros and cons list so that the reader can evaluate whether this may be the application for them, such as a restaurant may not have room for a whole charging table, but a smaller charging stand may work better for them. Um, as well, we have an approximate cost of the application and we let them know as well the seasonality. So is this something that must only be put out in the summer, more like a charging table, or is this something that can be used year round? At the bottom of the informational guide, we have a small gauge as well as the percent of survey respondents that were in favor of this application to better give the reader an idea of will this application be used, um, is it wanted? So now moving on to our conclusions and recommendations. The first conclusion we did draw as a team is that the popularity of solar is increasing on the island in recent years and that the island does have a desire to be sustainable. Our second conclusion is that when we are installing these small scale off-grid systems, we do need to be cautious because this is an unregulated field and there are not many rules or jurisdictions on these applications, so we do need to make a good, a good impression with these applications. And our last conclusion is immediate and long-term potential applications. So the applications we see making an immediate impact would be the trash compactors, uh, solar panels on golf courses, and solar pergolas, and some of the long-term potential applications that would need a little bit more of an explanation to get the public's opinion on and understanding would be the charging tables, lockers, and parking kiosks. So our first recommendation would be to the P Department of Public Works to continue their installation of Big Bellies on Island and continue to apply for grants to get this funding. And we see that this could be a great idea because the public survey did show that a lot of respondents were in favor of this application. And our second recommendation would be to remain Nantucket to use their installation of the solar pergola at the corner table as an educational tool to help encourage solar in the downtown area. 
So our third recommendation is for golf courses. We recommend that golf uh, golf courses consider the gradual adoption of solar on their courses, starting out smaller, uh, using solar to charge their golf carts and possibly moving up towards charging their clubhouse and even their full irrigation system using solar. We believe that golf courses are a key target for this as their property is less visible from the public way and they have a lot more space uh, of property. Our fourth recommendation is that if the town of Nantucket were to look at implementing paid parking, that they do further research and look at solar parking kiosks to uh, face this problem. And our final recommendation is we recommend to remain to purchase and lend out a solar generator and even possibly give a grant to a different um, company if they don't feel that they could do this themselves. But This would help promote um, solar around the town and keep educating people on it. We would like to acknowledge quickly our sponsors from Remain Nantucket, Jen King, Rachel Hobart, Cecil Baron Jensen, and Vierna Gonzalez, our advisors, Dominic Golding and Fred Luft, and some of our key interviewees, Tim Carthers from Axmart Solar, Lauren Sinatra from the Nantucket Energy Office, and Raymond Pohl of the Historic District Commission. Thank you. Questions? Have any questions for the Remain team? Keen, you've got to come up here. <laughs> you've got to come all the way up here. <laughs> the TV crew says they can't pick the questions up if you're in the back of the room, so don't be shy. <laughs> uh, you guys mentioned that you mentioned that the uh, the grid is maxed out in terms of large scale large scale solar. On the island, do you know why that is? Um, so I can explain that a bit more. It's I don't believe it's maxed out at the moment, but uh, Miss Sinatra talked to us about it during uh, her interview. It's a matter of the number of residential solar systems that are on the island. Uh, it has reached kind of its capacity in terms of the I think I believe it's the feedback into the grid okay. that it can handle. Um, you can Miss Sinatra said that you can talk to her afterwards when we uh, brought it up because we weren't experts in the field, obviously, um, but. That was one key thing that we noticed that obviously off-grid products wouldn't contribute to that issue as they go about handling updating the infrastructure. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, thank you for your presentation. So I'm wondering if there's any way to parse out for each of your four proposed um, installations, if there's any way to identify whether the people were not interested in them because they were solar or they just didn't want them at all. So like, for instance, a beach locker, maybe the, maybe the public doesn't want any kind of beach locker, whether it uh, doesn't have any electricity or not. Or maybe, you know, for something like a phone charging station, they want that, but they don't think it needs to be a solar application. It could just be a plug in a wall. So is there any way to parse out uh, those specific things? Yes. So to that point, uh, this is one of the graphs that Garrett discussed briefly. Uh, Most uh, residents or survey respondents do agree that solar power should be more encouraged on Nantucket. So we don't see uh, the problem with most of these applications being solar whatsoever, but more aesthetic concerns. We had um, some comments. We had a lot of comments on our survey because we left open questions for people to leave concerns. And a lot of them were aesthetic concerns or um, like Alicia mentioned before, phone usage. A lot of seasonal residents didn't want to encourage the use of phones on the island. So for example, like if we go to the charging locker graphs, we can see, would you use charging lockers? Only about 20% of people said that they would use them. And then as well, we had uh, what the aesthetic impact would look like. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, thank you. (laughs) Thank Uh, you. I mean, it's a little bit too is, like do people not want charging lockers or do they not want any lockers? And Kentucky is a special place where a lot of the beaches don't have a lot of built up infrastructure. So trying to 
maybe parse those things out in the future for your client would would be helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, I, I like your recommendation about the uh, trash compactors. Do you know, have you collected any data on if Nantucket has many of them, how well they work, and how, um, how much they're used? Yeah, um, we talked with Graham Durovich, the DPW, about that, and they have them in a couple uh, locations on the island. I believe there are five sites, um, and they're currently uh, applying for a grant to replace a lot of them. Um, from our interview with her, they were very useful and they had an effect, although the previous versions had issues with cell reception. So they were supposed to send out a signal when they were full, um, but they were having issues with that. And they're hoping the newer versions will kind of alleviate that. And then depending on how well they perform, possibly getting more. Hi, team. Great job. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one example of an off-grid, small-scale solar idea we looked at many years ago, I want to say eight years ago, was a solar charging bench, which would have been located at a local cafe downtown. Um, at the time, you know, it was price prohibitive. It was between eight and ten thousand dollars. And then when we looked at that company to see what the price was nowadays, we found that they don't even offer it anymore. They've completely pivoted away from small-scale solar and offer now uh, kiosks. Do you know why that is? Were they not selling? Was it too price prohibitive for other municipalities? Any insight as to? Because I also know in some, some of the surveys, uh, people noted that a bench could be a good application. Um, curious why that went away completely. Yeah, I think that's actually a really interesting point because I know there is um, seating and stuff and this was something we discussed with you, but I believe, as you said, very cost prohibitive. I know that some people, if they looked at the big belly trash compactors and saw that they were almost $4,000 a unit, they would say it's a trash can. <laughs> So um, it really is, as you said as well, uh, cost goes down. And if the company doesn't sell them anymore, that is definitely as well consumer demand as well. I think that one of the points is that the bench is small and probably only one or two people can sit next to the charger and use a charger, whereas a station with four individual seats and multiple uh, plugs and outlets is more accessible. I can also see the benches being um, more likely to... Uh, experience more wear and tear uh, because of how exposed they are and there's no umbrella on top or anything to that effect. But we don't actually have any research specifically on benches. Okay, well thanks guys, appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't want to cut questions off, but if uh, anyone has uh, more questions, they can certainly approach the teams after the presentation, but I do want to try and keep us on track in terms of the schedule. So next up is the team uh, that's been looking at the conversion to LED streetlights uh, on Nantucket, and the team comprises, whilst they get themselves sorted out here, Brendan King, Luke Marcoux, uh, Forrest Miller, and Sam Sands. And they've been working with uh, Lawrence Sinatra in the Nantucket Energy Office and Gail Walker uh, with Nantucket Lights. And as I say, their topic, as you can see up here with the uh, cute animation, is on LED streetlights. All right, hi everyone. As Dominic mentioned, I'm Sam. I'm presenting with Luke Marcoux, Forrest Miller, and Brendan King on our project, LED Street Lighting on Nantucket. So now for a summary of our presentation, we will discuss the goal of our project, the problems relating to our project, some proposed solutions, a review of best practices, and our final conclusion and recommendations. So in short, um, the goal of our project is to evaluate the best practices of an LED streetlight conversion and how these practices can be applied on Nantucket. Um, some of you might be familiar in the past, there have been two LED pilot programs, uh, one in 2014 with the decorative streetlights and another in 2019 with the Cobra Head streetlights um, on Milestone Road. And uh, the reception of these two pilot programs helped um, it bring the NEO towards wanting to look at this project more holistically with a group like us. So um, the objectives that we went through in order to satisfy this project goal were to research best practices for converting current street lighting to LED 
including an evaluation of Massachusetts towns that have already converted to LED street lighting, to solicit input from stakeholders on Nantucket regarding possible conversion of the existing Cobra-style HPS streetlights, um, the overhanging orangish light lights that you might have seen um, in the areas outside of the historic downtown, um, as well as to develop a set of processes and policies for the implementation of an LED conversion based on the findings from these first two objectives. So a brief explanation of what light pollution is. Light pollution is scattered artificial light, uh, predominantly from street lights and interior or exterior lighting. Um, there are four main types of light pollution that we read about in our research. First being light trespass, and that's unwanted light um, making its way into places it shouldn't be, especially into private residences, um, as well as glare, and that would be light that visually impairs uh, people, especially pedestrians and motorists as it enters their eye line. Um, sky glow, and that's how the entire night sky is being brightened due to light pollution. And related to sky glow, uh, there is light clutter, where how large groupings of many lights is a big contributor to sky glow, as well as an additional visual distraction. So based on the experts that, um, or based on the metrics that experts use, we've read that about um, in the period from 2012 to 2021, there's been a 20% increase in light pollution on Nantucket. And um, that light pollution, uh, especially uh, light trespass, can impact uh, human sleeping patterns as well as the circadian rhythm, as well as can have negative impact on wildlife, such as migratory patterns of birds, or we've also read about how um, other coastal communities that have sea turtles can impact the way that they lay their eggs. So the image in front of you to give a, maybe a more um, relatable picture to that, in 2012, this is what light pollution looked like on Nantucket. And then in 2021, you can see that 20% increase um, in the areas uh, that are highlighted here. We've noted where the actual town is, where the school is, um, as well as the airport in Sconset, um, as, spe as specific areas that there's been a great increase in light pollution. So now for energy savings. Light pollution costs the United States around $3.5 billion a year to, to poorly planned outdoor lighting. Part of the problem are the HPS or high pressure sodium bulbs, which we are all used to. And compared to these bulbs, LEDs or light emitting diodes have very high energy efficiency and will last a long time. They can also be dimmed to further reduce energy waste and can also be more directed than the HPS bulbs, which will scatter around a lot more. Um, any bit of misdirected light is um, going to be a contributor to light, po light pollution and reduced energy savings. So of course, the LEDs will be more helpful in these scenarios. To shift from the national perspective down to Nantucket, uh, currently all streetlights are owned and maintained by Nantucket's electricity provider, National Grid. Nantucket pays around $7,700 per month to maintain the streetlights. The other two components of this bill being the supply and actual delivery of the electricity. They do this for around 600 Cobra Head streetlights. Of, of these 600 streetlights, around eight of them are LED and thus come with different specifications. Also, when installing LEDs, it's very important to also uh, care about the color temperature of the lights. So for those of you unfamiliar with color temperature, color temperature is a metric used to measure the quality that is emitted from different lights. Uh, for street lights, we'll really only be concerned with the 4,000 to 2,200 range. Uh, when you're driving down the street in Nantucket, most of the lights, if, um, if not all the lights you're gonna see, are high pressure sodium lights or HPS lights. And they're usually about the 2,200 Kelvin range, that really uh, orange glow. Meanwhile, LEDs typically range anywhere from 4,000 Kelvin to 2,700 Kelvin. Another thing to uh, note when selling LEDs and other street lights is their bug rating. Bug rating is a term specific to street lights and has to do with the lights backlight, uplight, and glare. Uh, in, so to define backlight, uh, as you can see in this graph, backlight is some of the light trespass that comes off street lights that's not going where it's intended to go. And uplight is light that goes directly up into the atmosphere and then contributes to sky glow. To help prevent this, uh, often shields are installed onto lights to mitigate the amount of light trespass that is being produced. But and the reason to convert to LEDs is that shields are no longer being produced for these LED uh, for these HPS lights. So in order to properly shield your lights, you're going to have to update to LEDs. Also, uh, by updating to LEDs with proper shielding, it allows the lights to be dark sky compliant, which makes the night sky more visible. So now that you've read all the problems, uh, we're going to move on to the ideal lighting scenario. 
So if Nantucket was to perform an LED conversion, this is exactly what they would want. They would want reduced energy consumption, first and foremost, from the LEDs, minimal maintenance from the LEDs, because you have to spend less time actually changing the bulbs, automatic dimming after a certain amount of time, so that way it produces less light pollution, and to make sure you have dark sky compliant features. So now this, if this is what Nantucket wants, how do we get there? Well, one of these options would be for the scenario where Nantucket stays with National Grid as the owners of the Cobrahead streetlights on the island. Since uh, National Grid would still own these streetlights, if Nantucket wanted to perform an LED conversion, they would have to ask for National Grid to perform the conversion. And we assume that Nantucket would wait for National Grid to have the 3000 Kelvin color temperature LEDs in stock before installing them for a third LED pilot program to see uh, whether or not the public would like this color temperature. If they enjoy it, they can proceed to install them in more LED streetlights. Or if the public reception is not that great, they can remove those LEDs and convert them back to HPS. With these conversions, there will be some cost savings in energy consumption and maintenance due to the LEDs. However, there, Nantucket would have no control over the lighting fixture designs that the LEDs would be installed in, and they would have to continue paying the electric bill, all components of the electric bill, to National Grid. Therefore, there's another option for the town of Nantucket. They can buy all the streetlights from National Grid. This comes with an initial investment of around $260,000. However, with an effective lighting design system, it will give the town the ability to further mitigate light pollution and it, as well as further cost savings since they can install lights of the appropriate wattage at each location to maximize visibility and, mini and minimize light pollution. However, this does come with an increased responsibility on behalf of the town as it would be up to them to secure a maintenance contractor either through the Department of Public Works or another subcontractor to maintain these streetlights. However, this is not as much of, of an issue with LEDs as they come with much longer lifetimes and lower maintenance needs. As I touched on earlier, uh, through a series of interviews was how we were going to get information from other communities. So on the map above is um, some different communities we spoke with, as well as one of the regional planning organizations for the uh, Cape Cod. Um, the way that we, we helped create a list of potential contact points with our sponsors, and we reached out to them by email to schedule Zoom and phone interviews to ask pointed questions about their experience with LED streetlight conversions, as well as reaching out to some other um, experts in lighting design, lighting, as well as dark sky advocates to ask them questions about the best way to approach an LED streetlight conversion. Uh, as Sam just mentioned, when we interviewed all these different towns, the most important thing we gathered was a list of best practices. Uh, these, this included the forming of a working group or a committee to hire a consultant and to purchase the streetlights, to install a pilot demo, and to find a maintenance contractor for said lights, to regulate light pollution, and to develop a relationship with the regional planning organization. Just to expand further on the idea of creating an LED street, light, uh, street lighting working group, this could be an, another working group, as Nantucket has several of them, so they're familiar with how they work. They have the ability to gather stakeholder input from all sorts of people within the town. Uh, this would be municipal, so it would be under town administration. Some potential um, Members could be the Department of Public Works, the Select Board, the Town of Nantucket Energy Office, and, other, and dark sky advocates such as Nantucket Lights. Our second best practice would be to hire an LED street lighting consultant. The consultant would be able to help guide Nantucket through the conversion process, and a budget can be decided on in an annual town meeting for hiring this consultant. The consultant would be able to help with contracting out outside organizations for the process, as well as performing a GIS audit, which would update the inventory of uh, the streetlights on Nantucket. And using this updated inventory, the consultant would be able to perform an accurate economic analysis of just how much it would cost to perform this uh, LED conversion and how long it would take to get the savings back. Uh, they would also be able to help with creating a budget for the entire program, which would have to be done before a town meeting. And they would then suggest, before doing anything else, to Nantucket to purchase the streetlights from National Grid. 
Our third best practice with regards to the installation of the streetlights. So something I've touched on a few times has been pilot programs. And from all of our interviews, every single successful LED streetlight conversion had a very important pilot demo to gauge that the community members were content with the style of lights that were being recommended, specifically for the color temperature or the uh, outside design and how they looked within their community. And then based on these um, opinions of the public, uh, Nantucket would go forward with the installation of these streetlights. Uh, depending on the consultant that they have uh, from the different people we talked to, that might be something that's part of the services that the street lighting consultant offers, or it would be subcontracted out to another group to perform this installation. And lastly is the concern of maintenance. So as we've mentioned, maintenance is a potential area for savings, but this uh, is important to consider the interim period during the installation where there's still some high power sodium bulbs as well as LEDs. And then afterwards, when it's a fully converted LED program, um, what kind of maintenance provider could be sourced and creating a contract with them to effectively service the streetlights as they're needed. So after the lights have been installed, it's important to make sure that the correct color temperature was chosen for each of the lights. Uh, for example, uh, warmer temperature is almost always more widely accepted. However, there are some drawbacks. For example, a, a cooler color temperature, more like a 3000 or a 4000, uh, provides better visual clarity. So if it was on a busy intersection, you'd be able to see cars more easily versus uh, 2200 Kelvin, which is very warm, what you're used to. You're not, it looks better with the, on the eyes, but it doesn't uh, help with clarity at all. The next thing you want to do is to choose a control system. A, a proper control system for a streetlight can range anywhere from a daylight sensor to a built-in timer to a wireless control module. And it's very important, depending on the town, depending on the situation, to choose the right sensor uh, for the application. And finally, you're going to want to install those controls on each of the streetlights to help mitigate the light pollution and to help, uh, in some cases, save money if the, uh, if the electricity provider allows for it. In addition to these, we also came across some other key recommendations that we would advise the town of Nantucket to do when undergoing the street lighting conversion. One of them is to develop a working relationship with a larger regional plan planning group. Currently, Nantucket is in a regional planning group. It contains one town, Nantucket. Um, just uh, in Cape Cod and in Martha's Vineyard, there's the Cape Light Compact, which we had interviewed, and they had expressed interest in uh, furthering the relationship with the islands uh, of Nantucket so that way uh, they can be called upon with their previous experience and also their network to get perhaps some better deals when purchasing streetlights and finding a maintenance contractor. Additionally, it would be good to implement a system for resident feedback for the streetlights. As, as National Grid currently owns the uh, streetlights uh, on Nantucket, if there is an issue, the person who is reporting this has to call National Grid directly. If there is a resident feedback system, this could be a form online. This would be much easier for the town to organize a maintenance trip as whoever is filling out this form will provide the location as well as the issue. So as we had said earlier, this is not going to be a free process. There is going to be some money involved here. Uh, so if the town of Nantucket decides to stay with National Grid and perform an LED street lighting conversion with them, we estimate that around this would save the town around 40% uh, of their current electric bill uh, for their street lights, around $92,000 a year. Um, and this does not necessarily have a return on investment since this is not the town taking on a new project. However, if the town decides to buy the streetlights, we estimate that this can save around 53%, uh, potentially even more, uh, for their, uh, for their streetlighting bill since it, the maintenance would become their responsibility and it's a much lower uh, maintenance requirement for LED streetlights. We estimate that this would have a return on investment from around four to eight years. And finally, uh, just as a summary, the best practices that we found were to create a working group to hire a consultant and purchase the streetlights uh, from National Grid. Alternatively, National Grid can perform a LED pilot program with 3000K lights. And if they are uh, found favorable by the town, then National Grid could perform the conversion. However, this comes with the caveat that the town of Nantucket would have less oversight throughout this conversion process. And to end this off, we would like to thank our sponsors, Lauren Sinatra of the Town of Nantucket Energy Office, Gail Walker, founder of Nantucket Lights, our advisors, Dominic Golding and Fred Luft, Young's Bicycles for letting us rent bikes during our stay, and the Nantucket Yacht Club for housing during our stay. Any questions? Hi. 
Um, so if we stay with Nant uh, National Grid, would they be required? I know that you said that we wouldn't have, as a town, necessarily the oversight to choose new fixtures or have any idea of what they would be. Would they have to um, be under the guise of the HDC for approval or is because it's a municipal property project, they wouldn't have to get HDC approval for new lighting? Uh, so uh, as far as I understand, if National Grid were to perform the conversion without a working group or anything like that, they would not have to go through the historical association or anything like that. It would be done completely independently through a contract. Uh, and if I don't know if you want to know uh, any more than that, you'd be happy to talk with our sponsor, uh, Lawrence Sinatra, uh, who probably knows a little bit more about it than I do. Thank you. Any other questions? No questions in text either, Fred, huh? Uh, Lauren, do you want to add? Oh, Sarah's going to ask a question. We purposely put the microphone on this side of the room, knowing that all the people who we're going to ask questions were going to be on the far side of the room. I needed exercise. <laughs> um, hi. I just, I, you may have said this about whether or not you talk to representatives from National Grid, but I know that their current policy is 4,000 K LED. So if they, and you guys have only talked about using 3,000 as the max. And so I was wondering if, they are amenable to that pilot project. So if we like stayed with National Grid and we did the 3000K, like would they do 3000K pilot project and would they actually listen to the constituents to see if that was an amenable time? So currently uh, National Grid is in the approval process to obtain 3000K uh, streetlights uh, through uh, something regarding the larger like utility uh, department of the state of Massachusetts. So that option is contingent upon that. Uh, currently, from our research, we know that having 4,000K streetlights usually doesn't fit uh, the aesthetic that people want. Um, and additionally, uh, it comes with uh, effects of adverse effects of light pollution regarding like circadian rhythms and mm -hmm. blue light and other adverse effects to wildlife. Yeah, in regards to that pilot uh, project, we would, it, it, like in the scenario that um, we talked about with uh, Nantucket staying with National Grid, um, we would assume that Nantucket would wait for those uh, 3,000 Kelvin uh, LED lights to be in stock before actually performing it so that um, it's a lower color temperature because there are already some pilot uh, 4,000 LEDs along Milestone Road, I believe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Lauren, did you want to uh, add anything to the team's you, you got to come up here, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also have some lovely brochures up here from Nantucket Lights, if anyone would like to come. Uh, is really passionate about light pollution. They're right here. Just want to thank the team. I think you did an incredible job. You've helped us to cultivate some very valuable relationships with other um, munis municipalities and planning agencies in the state, which are we're going to follow up on and, and retain going forward. Um, there's a lot of decisions we have to make going forward. Um, many towns on the mainland in Massachusetts have already converted to LEDs, and we can learn from their mistakes and examples. We see a lot of their 4,000s and 5,000s coming down, um, and a lot of those decisions were made by their energy committees looking alone at energy savings. But at this point in time, we understand it has to be a, a more balanced decision um, Nantucket's dark sky as you know, an asset to the community, to the island, needs to be part of that conversation as well. So thank you for your thoughtful research, and um, we'll, we'll continue to the, approach this in the most appropriate way for the island's best interest. But thank you, team. You did a great job. Thank you, Lauren. Yes, thank you. OK, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. And last but not least, uh, we have the team that's been working with the town manager's office. So if they want to get themselves sorted out, I will introduce them. They are Gabriel, uh, Gabriel, sorry, uh, Bonamano, Lauren Flanagan, Garrett Sheehan, and Hannah Shell. And they've been working with uh, Libby Gib Gibson and Greg Tivnan in the uh, town manager's office. Um, and they've been looking at the development of a citizen's academy. Uh, an academy to encourage uh, greater participation in government affairs by uh, members of the community 
and they've uh, done a lot of research on what goes on in other communities and what might apply in the Nantucket context. So uh, it's over to you guys. All right, hello, we are Team Citizens Academy. I'm Lauren Flanagan. I'm Gabriel Bonamano. I'm Garrett Sheehan. And I'm Hannah Shell. And the overarching goal of our project in collaboration with the Nantucket Town Manager's Office was to create a Nantucket Citizens Academy curriculum that informs citizens of the town government structure, how services on the island are funded and delivered, and what challenges Nantucket faces overall. Can you change the slide, please? Here's a brief outline of the topics we will cover today, and we'll be taking questions at the end of our presentation. All right, so some of the key takeaways that we got from our background research is that currently there is a lack of civic engagement in the U.S. that can be seen on both the federal and local levels. Um, as you can see here, the U.S. Um, saw only a 54% voter turnout in the 2012 federal election. This is low in comparison to other countries such as Belgium, which saw over 87% voter turnout in their election. This has persisted in the U.S. in more recent elections such as 2016, uh, which did not significantly improve. And then also on a more local level, uh, the main form of civic engagement used is public meetings, uh, where citizens can voice their opinions to the government. However, a national study of civic health in 2012 found that only 9% of respondents actually had attended these meetings in the past two years. This trend can also be found on Nantucket specifically, where only 11% of voters attended the last annual town meeting and only 17% voted in the most recent elections. One solution that many communities have turned to is a Citizens Academy. A Citizens Academy is an educational program aimed at increasing citizen and government knowledge, increasing citizen involvement in government affairs, and improving community relations. This is done through an engaging interactive curriculum in which participants learn about the government from department officials over several sessions. Here are our goals and objectives. So when creating our model, we began by identifying current Citizens Academy practices. We then moved on to soliciting public opinions by interviewing community members and conducting a survey. Department opinions were also solicited via interviews with key department members. After completing the first three objectives, we then developed a series of project deliverables that serve as a guiding model for the creation of a Nantucket Citizens Academy. Uh, here are our methods and findings. For our first objective, we researched many existing academies to determine common trends and interview three academy facilitators asking about uh, academy content and delivery, implementation, marketing, and measuring of success for their academies. In our research, we found several trends in citizens' academies across the United States and in Massachusetts specifically. Uh, some academies covered the entire town government, while others are specific to only one department, such as citizens' police academies. We found that most academies have an average class size of 20 to 25 participants and hold about 6 to 12 evening sessions for 2 to 3 hours each. Additionally, nearly all academies emphasize interactive and hands-on learning to keep participants interested. We also interviewed the academy facilitators from the towns of Lexington and Barnstable, Massachusetts, as well as from the Nantucket Citizens Police Academy. From these interviews, we learned facilitators are important for maintaining a citizen's academy, money should be allocated for an academy, small groups enhance community building among participants, Advertisement and outreach is essential to reach these participants, and participant feedback is necessary to improve the academy. For our second objective, we needed to gauge current civic engagement on Nantucket, the public's knowledge of the town government, as well as the public's interests and preferences for a citizen's academy. We did this by interviewing four community members and by distributing a survey. In our survey, which was available in English and Spanish, we received 103 responses, along with 38 responses having worked for the town government or served on a town board commission or committee. These will be referred to as uh, municipally involved citizens. We also received 64 responses from the general public. Hmm. Prominent Nantucket community figures that we interviewed included Jason Graziade, Chantal Bloss-Murphy, Peter Morrison, and Brooke Moore, 
And in these interviews, we discuss topics such as public outreach methods to try and reach all of Nantucket's diverse population, um, any suggestions they had for academy content um, and delivery, and also the facilitation of this process. And then lastly, we asked about translation of materials, which was important to us. In our survey, we asked the general public respondents to rate their agreement to statements regarding citizen knowledge and participation in town government. As seen in the figure, the general consensus was that both participation and knowledge should be improved on Nantucket. However, fewer respondents indicated strong interest in further engaging themselves. To further evaluate the current civic engagement levels of the community, we asked that all survey respondents we asked all survey respondents to write how often they participated in a variety of municipal events. As seen in this figure, municipally involved citizens participate far more often in all of the listed options, while the general public indicated rarely or never participating. Of these options, town voting and annual town meetings saw the highest participation rates for both groups. All survey participants were later asked if they believed a Nantucket Citizens Academy would be an effective solution to increasing civic engagement and if they'd be willing to attend one. The consensus was that if they do believe a Citizens Academy can efficiently increase civic engagement. Based on the results of these survey questions and our interviews, both in-person and online options should be considered for the Academy. Our third objective was to obtain input from town officials, including those in town administration, the Department of Public Works, sewer, finance, diversity, equity, and inclusion, culture and tourism, and also from the select board. Um, the goal of these interviews was to learn about each department's mission and objectives, what questions they commonly get from the public, um, any suggestions that they have for the academy, and how to measure the success of the academy once it's created. Um, other topics included those mentioned in Objective 2. Our fourth objective was to develop a series of project deliverables. These include a standard academy session template, a model session for the Department of Public Works, and two questionnaires to evaluate the academy's success. Although the initial scope of this project included just four departments, the full academy is intended to cover all departments within town government. We've developed academy templates to gather information for each department that include questions about the following. The department's mission, its key members and structure, its functions and services, its budget, challenges it faces, and how citizens can learn more about or get involved with the department. The template also includes guidelines for the creation of a case study and an interactive activity to further engage the academy participants. There are four components to the detailed DPW Academy session model that we proposed. The first is a presentation that answers all the previous questions stated in the Academy template. This is accompanied by a pamphlet that will contain additional information, such as a review of slide content or more details regarding specific topics mentioned in the program for participants to take home. The next component is a brief case study about the recycling and solid waste processes which is accompanied by a facilities tour by, to further enhance the presentation. In order to improve academy iterations for the future, we have also created two questionnaires to evaluate the academy's presenters, content, and, and organization, as well as solicit general participant feedback. One questionnaire will be given after each academy session, and one will be given after the final session. We also recommend that a quantitative measure of academy success, uh, similar to the one shown on this slide, be implemented in addition to qualitative feedback. Now we will move on to recommendations. All right, so one of the next steps that we have in creating this Nantucket Citizens Academy is trying to develop a budget that can be used to account for the following. First, there's facilitators who will manage the academy. Um, you also need to account for presentation, uh, the presentations that go on. So any presenters need to be compensated for their time. Um, also, child care for participants with young children, um, food and venue costs, as well as transportation to the academy, and then lastly, any academy materials that we will need. Among the 103 responses we received, this was the most favored academy schedule. The academy begins with an overview of town government and concludes with a graduation ceremony, with all other sessions covering specific departments. It should be noted that our small sample size does not fully represent Nantucket's population. Therefore, another survey is recommended to ensure these details are representative. 
Some future work that we believe could enhance and build upon a Citizens Academy includes creating short videos that are available to citizens to learn about their town government at their own pace, expanding the target audience to beyond year-round residents, based on our survey data and multiple interviews, additional audiences such as seasonal residents, businesses, and students could benefit from a variation of a Citizens Academy. Lastly, involving high school students in the form of a community service project in which they develop photo or video material for the Academy could also be beneficial. Lastly, we would like to thank our project sponsors, Elizabeth Gibson and Greg Tivnan of the Nantucket Town Manager's Office for their guidance on this project, as well as the Public Outreach Manager, Florencia Rulo, for helping us translate and distribute our survey. We'd also like to thank our project advisors, Dominic Golding and Fred Luft, all of our interviewees, the people who distributed and took our survey, and the Nantucket Yacht Club, Land Council, and Athenaeum for providing us a place to stay and work on Nantucket. Lastly, thank you to Young's Bicycle Shop for, for providing us a way to get around the island, Remain Nantucket for welcoming us to Nantucket, and all of you for coming to see our presentation. So thank you for your time today. We'll now be taking questions. And also, if you'd like to contact us afterwards, our email is on the screen. OK, thank you, team. And does anyone have any questions? I should say, Greg just sent me a text saying he's stuck in hospital still. Oh, no. I don't see him in the room. <laughs> so I don't think he made it. Um, so he apologizes for that. Um, Libby, do you have anything you want to add at this point or uh, re-emphasize? Um, I don't know to, if I want to add much. The team was great. They had a lot of uh, really good ideas and did a lot of really good research. This is an effort we've been trying to get off the ground for several years now, and it takes a dedicated person to set it up and run it. And um, we really liked the way they developed a template for us. And so hopefully it'll give us some additional groundwork to, to eventually, hopefully sooner rather than later, get it off the ground. So thanks for a great job, you guys. You were really fun to work with. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Oh, uh, uh, thank you. Thanks, Libby. Uh, I would ask you the same question I asked the other teams. Uh, so what was what were some of the big surprises in your your travels around and conversations with people what did you what did you uh, what were you surprised that you just didn't expect to find when you got to the island I mean well first of all just from our background research I was uh, very surprised by the amount of department or number of departments that are under the town manager's office and so going out and seeing all these people and talking to them was a really great experience because we got a lot of different points of view. Um, I feel like doing an overall encompassing um, academy makes it so that we got to talk to a number of different types of like um, perspectives. Um, and so just going around and interviewing all those people was a, a really valuable experience for me. I guess to build off of that, um I was a bit surprised about the work that we did. I, when I came into this project, I was expecting to do a little more on the actual model, um, but we ended up spending a lot of our time interviewing people, um, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Everybody that we interviewed was very nice and very kind to us, gave us a lot of useful information. Uh, so we're very thankful to have uh, all of their input for our project. Yeah, it was lost less, it was less intimidating than I thought it would be, honestly. <laughs> so That's good. I'm just um I'm just happy that everyone was so willing to work with us when we're, you know, a, a student mm -hmm. group and everyone is coming together to make this project a reality. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, we will wrap it up for the day. I'd like to thank everybody, thank all the students for their work this term, for their presentations today. And I'd like to thank all you in the audience and those who may be watching from elsewhere. Um, I, uh, I, th I hope I have most of your emails. I'll send out some blanket email at the end of the week that says where you can get copies of the report, where you can get uh, copies of the presentation. Um, uh, so expect that from me uh, towards the end of this week. And again, just thanks to everyone for welcoming, wel welcoming us 
back to the island. It's always a pleasure to come here and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again next year. I will be back on island in May uh, to rustle up new projects for next fall. Um, depending what turn COVID takes, we're assuming that we'll be back on island next, next, this time next year. So I'm more than happy to talk to anyone who's interested in, uh, in uh, proposing a project. Um, so please do get in touch with me uh, between now and then, or I'll catch up with you in May. So thanks very much. <laughs>